So Peter, could we start with you telling us a bit about um, Ralph and Katie and how they first came to life and um, then their journey through the A word and why you decided to continue beyond that brilliant last episode that featured them both so heavily. Um, yeah, of course, I um, well, as I think as everybody knows, there was a, and there's an Israeli series called Yellow Peppers written by Karen Marguerite, which was the kind of, which was the uh, jumping off point for the A word, which was I was asked to do a, a an English language version. Um, and then Karen had established a family dynamic in there that really worked for me. So I thought, why was I going to waste that? So the, char the, the characters at the beginning of the series uh, were, you know, were not quite a cover version, but based to some large extent on, on Karen's originals. In it, though, I was interested in the character of the music teacher, who uh, in my series is called Louise and played by Pookie. And the fact that as a parent myself, of a, uh, now a young man with learning disabilities, the sort of solidarity that develops between parents of children with learning disabilities, even if those disabilities are very different, because you a lot of your experiences as a parent uh, are, are, are similar and involve uh, and often include a kind of, you know, feeling slightly socially isolated and so on. So I thought it was important that if Louise was to have a son or daughter with a disability, that that should not be autism. Um, and because of my background in special education, um, uh, I was, you know, I had a lot of experience of families and young people with Down syndrome. So I decided that the character would be a young man with Down syndrome. I'd worked with Leon before on a series called From There to Here. Leon is very open about his ambition to be in Coronation Street and only really sees me as a stepping stone towards that. So we have, we have a reciprocal arrangement. Um, and so what became clear over the course of three series of the A Word was Leon's ability, like any writer, you're going to respond to the actors who are owning your story. And so I was writing more and more for him, and particularly his relationship with Morris, the Christopher Eccleston character, which emerged as this double act, because, you know, like all actors who are full of angst, Chris only really wants to do comedy. And so, um, the, you know, they had great... Leon's comic timing it, it, it is a wonder to behold. And, that you know, that, so they, that felt like a fully grounded relationship. And then, you know, it was, you know, the A word is a story that is about family life. So there's not going to be a murder or there's not going to be, you know, a missing child. So you start writing about, you know, the, the various stages in life. And one of the things I was interested in exploring was if Ralph, you know, should get married and, uh, and what, how that is for him and how that is for the Kate character and what that does in terms of his parents, particularly his mum, who has a certain way of being with him. In terms of a dramatist, you know, that seemed to me a gift. The, you know, it, it all comes back to what, what, what is gonna give you the most interesting story for these characters? What, what are we gonna put them through? And, and, and so the combination of Leon's performance and the fact that he already had these on-screen relationships made that a good place to go with it. You know, it was Leon's ability as an actor that drew me to write that story. And that's an incredible starting point, isn't it? And um, it gave you so many brilliant places to go. And um, can you tell us a bit about the introduction of Katie? Yeah, I mean, I, I had seen... Um, uh, Katie was, um, sorry, Sarah, Sarah Gordy, who plays Katie, was in a wonderful play called Jellyfish that I'd come across, at, I'd seen at the Bush. 
uh, and um, then it transferred to the national. And I thought before it occurred to me that she could be cast as, I think before I'd had the idea of marrying Ralph, I thought I'd like to write something for Sarah. And so the two things came together. I'd seen that she has a, a very different presence to Ralph. It's important to me, especially in representation of characters with disabilities, that we um, see them as character and see them as um, being able to, you know, uh, inhabit any set of characteristics and not be kind of stereotyped. So the fact that Leon and Sarah in real life, but also Ralph and Katie on the screen, have a very different kind of energy, both brilliant, gave them, you know, gave me again the opportunity as a writer to say, it all comes down to, I always come down to that, you know, in real life, Sarah Gordy is never without a smoothie. And Ralph would prefer to, uh, Leon would prefer crisps or a pie. And base, that is the, the basic dynamic of their relationship is what I, what I hope and the other writers as well did brilliantly put on screen that um, they work because of their differences. And that's again, for a couple who are different from most of the couples we see, that again is interesting that they have found a way to make that work through their love and through their, you know, their approach. So that, that's, yeah, it was seeing Sarah on stage, I was just blown away by her and that's, that was that really. Yeah, she is incredible. I can absolutely see why you would have been from captivated from seeing her performance. So that incredible last episode of the A Word, uh, where we, we got that wonderful wedding between Ralph and Katie, which made us all cry, and I then watched it again and cried again and then watched it a third time with my husband and cried long before they got to the ceremony because I was anticipating it by then. It's so brilliant. Um, and I think the audience were just so delighted to know that we were going to go on to the, the uh, journey with them as newlyweds. How did that come about? How, did, how was that sort of conceived and how did it happen? to the idea to, to move on? Um, well, it was partly, it was partly caused by lockdown, to be honest, because that third series and the wedding episode went out during lockdown. And I wanted to try and make some drama that would be possible to make under lockdown conditions. So what I pitched to the BBC was six 15 minute episodes, purely for iPlayer, done in a single room and I would um, show run and work with five disabled writers to shape them. And each episode would be self-contained and may contain one other character. And um, Piers Wenger, who was the head of BBC Drama at the time, was bolder than me and turned around and said, no, I want this to be a BBC One show half an hour, proper budget, proper show. I, you know, I don't want something that would just be tokenistic. So my idea that it, it didn't, you know, obviously that's harder to film, but it gave us the chance then to spend plenty of time in the writer's room developing the series. And it came about for the same reason that you said. I was, I was as captivated as everybody else by that wedding episode. Um, and I think that's always the advice I give to emerging writers is try and create characters that you are fascinated by and you want to know what they're going to do next, because that's going to drive you on to create a story. Yeah, oh, that's a, a brilliant tip to have. Um, so you mentioned there right from the start from when you were thinking of it as 15 minute pieces that you wanted to have a writer's room that used disabled writers. Um, it's un really unusual for the disabled writers to find themselves in a team where there is one other disabled writer even. Um, how did you go about creating that team? How did you start? Um, well, I don't, 
I was already aware that BBC Writers Room had an access group. Um, and I was aware of I was aware of Genevieve's work, and I was aware um, that there was a, a pool of writers that were working with BBC Writers Room, some more experienced than others. So it seemed a good place to, to look. And myself and Kat Pugsley, the rather brilliant scripts executive who worked all the way through the A word as well, came up with a, a one page outline of what the series might be. Asked, um, asked anybody in the writer's room who was on the access group or, or, or was identified as a disabled writer to pitch a story of the week for these two characters based on what they knew of the A word and what they knew of this one page outline. And then I think there was probably between 40 and 50 submissions. We also read examples of everybody's work. In fact, I, I made a point of reading the work before I read pitch, it was important to see at what stage they, it, they might feel to be in their writing journey. Because um, the other th you don't want to be putting people in the position where it's maybe a little too soon to be writing a full length dra drama and so on. So that's how it came, that's how we constructed it. There are probably other ways to construct it. That seemed to be the most practical way of, 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 of finding writers for this particular series and the timescale we had available. And um, just before we bring in the other writers also, how did you go about making sure that that was going to be an inclusive experience for those writers and and make sure that it was going to work and achieve everything that you wanted to do by having this uh, writer's room that's groundbreaking, really? Um, well, I have to say, that's a good question to ask as you're going to hand it over to everybody else, because in a way, we I think it would be fair to say that we all made it up as we went along. Uh, what I hope I created was an openness. Uh, by openness, I mean, I said early on, I didn't quite know what I was doing. So that end invited um, the rest of the team to help shape what we felt would work. Two big advantages were because of lockdown, the sessions were conducted on Zoom, uh, which was an advantage to, uh, rather than a disadvantage, not just because of the mobility issues that it solves, but because I think it creates a slightly different dynamic to being in a very, uh, you know, being in a writer's room where there's a competitive edge, which can turn into, I know I benefit from this, can turn into experienced white man domination in a room. Um, and the other thing that helped, I think, was that, um, we all knew every writer knew they were going to get an episode they we weren't they weren't in a bidding war with their ideas so that created an atmosphere where we were all happy to share ideas yes thank you that's a brilliant starting point and we'll pick up with the writers so um let's introduce annalisa annalisa uh, Daniela, I'm going to come to you in the order in which your episodes came. Um, so I'm going to go to Annalisa first. So she started her career in documentaries. She took part in the BBC uh, Writers Access Group talent scheme that Peter mentioned already. And she also did the Channel 4 Screenwriters Scheme. She's written for Sex Education, that I know a lot of the audience will also love, Doctors and the BBC short film series, The Break. Um, and Annalisa has also been very much part of the Writers Guild work. So um, she has been on the work Disabled Writers Working Party to help us develop 
good inclusive practice um, conditions for writers. So she's got lots of experience from the Writers Guild point of view as well. So Annalisa, could you tell us a bit about your episode first of all about the premise and then we'll maybe talk about some of those other issues too. Have you got Annalisa? Oh sorry there I go. I've unmuted myself successfully yay hey. uh, <laughs> sorry um uh, yes so my episode episode three I think my original pitch was a little bit different actually um I think it involved in a, an entirely different character. <laughs> and then we realized that because of casting that we couldn't um, center it around this character. So it sort of um, evolved organically and became about Tom uh, trying to look after a baby, which really helped us to explore Tom and really helped us with our love story um, and gave him an opportunity to interact with Danny. Um, so it was a fortuitous accident that that things changed along the way as they did. Um, and I think I was motivated because in the A word, we know Ralph very, very well, but we don't know Katie. And I really wanted to get to know Katie. And I was really curious about her. And I wanted to throw everything I could at her and put her in under as much stress as possible and see how she reacted. Um, and I wanted to explore the subject of being a wife and how, we all understand as women our roles in the world and looking at her specific role models and her um, deciding how to do it her way and um, understanding what her way was. Yes, that's um, such a great episode. And Annalisa, you've been in other writers' rooms as well. How was this, because it's not only a first series, but creating something set up to be an inclusive writer's room right from the get go. Tell us about that experience. This, yeah. So um, in other rooms I've been in, uh, there's that kind of, I think a lot of people who are perhaps in an underrepresented group or in a minority understand that feeling when you come into a room and you're not just doing your job, but you're also slightly expected to represent a certain viewpoint. There's sort of like extra, extra work involved, um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing at all, but it is, it can, um, I don't know, I always feel there's a slight burden on your shoulders. Um, I'm visually impaired, by the way, that's, that's my impairment. And um, when we came into this room on Zoom, I think there was just this incredible collective relief and joy because we didn't have to do that. We were just, we were just there to write. And actually the beauty of Zoom, I mean, it was in that terrible second lockdown, that awful winter that went on forever. And I think we were all just so happy to see each other. We were just, we were just so delighted to be together. So it didn't feel like work. It really didn't. It just felt like um, a charming couple of hours talking about hot cross buns and, <laughs> and listening to Pete uh, tell interesting jokes and um, occasionally making notes on a piece of paper. And, and then it sort of Ralph and Katie evolved out of that. That sounds incredible. And it, what did the experience mean to you, Annalisa, having the opportunity? It meant a lot to me personally, because as a writer, when I first saw the A word, when it came out, I remember really, really sitting up and thinking this, this tone, this is what I want to do. This is how I want to write. I want to write in this very specific tone um, that this guy called Peter Bowker uses. Um, it's just really unflinching about the challenging traumatic moments in life but reveling in quite infantile humor along the way <laughs> and I thought that that's that's me that's what I want to do so I had a really kind of intimate connection with that series anyway because it was just genuinely such an inspiration and so when the, when I saw the the little advert come out um I jumped on it and and then I was just chuffed to bits to be included and um what did it mean for you as a disabled writer being in, in that room and, and having that inclusive experience? How was it different for you to be part of that team? 
yeah I think I think if you know it's possible to have a an experience which is just completely stress-free and incredibly inclusive I think once you've sort of tasted that then when when you don't <laughs> you feel it maybe possibly a bit more but just to give you an example of how incredibly thoughtful and inclusive this team was Kat Pugsley when the press came out she personally sat down and typed out a review of something because it had been um it had been delivered in an inaccessible format um for, for my eyes and you know, she's the executive producer of this thing she has a million things to do and she sat down and she personally typed it out for me that's the level of attention to detail and care that this team has i mean i i don't think it i don't think there's a parallel anywhere in this industry that's commitment isn't it isn't it mm. yeah thanks so much annalisa we're going to talk to you again and you're going to chip in too aren't you if you've got things to add as we as sure we sure brilliant thank you um so i'm going to introduce genevieve genevieve Barr. So uh, Genevieve co-wrote the incredible Ben Barbara McAllen that I know so many of you will have watched and loved and also wrote on the brilliant monologue series Crypt Tales. And she's currently working on a range of commissions and development projects. Um, and uh, Genevieve was an actor first. Is that right, Genevieve? You're acting before you started to write. Yeah. And um, Peter and I were chatting a bit earlier on and we both wondered whether it was your experience of, of acting and the scripts that were, were in your hands that led you to, to want to write. Um, yes, I mean, um, um, hi everyone, I'm in Liverpool by the way, is there anybody who's from the Northwest? Um, I'm saying a special hello to you there. Um, I'm, a, I'm a deaf, um, I'm a deaf woman and um, I came into acting when I was 21 in a BBC drama called The Shallows and, um, and and I had had no dramatic training before that, so I was um, a teacher in a secondary school and a friend was looking for a deaf actor and it was the classic tale of there are, there are no kind of deaf people working in the industry, which wasn't true, but, um, you know, the, the net hadn't been cast that far and wide. Um, so I was asked to audition and I got it. And then after that, um, so, um, after I got representation, the conversation just became about what kind of deaf person I was um, and what the requirement was in terms of the roles that I would play. So I was told very quickly, you can't play any hearing characters because you're deaf and we need to be able to explain that. So even though you could speak, um, uh, you don't speak well enough to qualify for this kind of character. And then I grew up in a family that is all hearing and um, and I didn't really grow up with sign language. It wasn't something that I was introduced to until I was in my twenties. So I always felt like I didn't represent uh, what people thought of as deaf as well. And so um, I, was, I felt like I was kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place of not feeling like I was authentically represented in any way and not feeling resentful of that, um, but feeling awkward about it because then um, I felt like I needed to explain why I was different. So I think after 12 years of that and trying to navigate that and feeling a little bit like I was roaming a little bit lost with that, um, I decided to start writing and um, the very wonderful Jack Thorne, who I've worked with a couple of times before as an actor, um, I reached out to him and asked him about how I should go about it. And he was really the person who kind of set me off on this journey of writing. And the wonderful thing that has been about writing has been about giving agency to um, and control in a way to you can write the things that you want to see on television and they might not make it there but that's another matter altogether but um, an actor is very often on the very very far end of a very very long production process so it was lovely to come in at the beginning and come in at the point of creation really yeah so that's, that's my way in yeah that's quite the journey isn't it um 
can, can you tell us just a little bit about the premise of your episode? I'm sure people have watched them all, but just so that they're aware which one was yours, Genevieve. I can. I um I wrote episode four, which was called Empty Nest, and um it was about um I, it was about reflecting on what we leave behind when we um when we leave home and about um it was a chance for Sarah and Leon to reflect on their own parents' marriages um compared to their own. Um because I think it's a fascinating thing, the way that we like to compare ourselves to other people um, and whether we match up to those expectations. So it was, yeah, I guess uh, Empty Nest was really about um, uh, Sarah's parent, uh, uh, Katie's parents being in trouble um, in terms of their relationship not working and putting a lot of pressure on Katie to figure out why that was and um, trying to determine if she had any sort of responsibility in the sort of unraveling of this relationship. Um, and, and, and of course she doesn't because every, every marriage, is, it, a marriage is made up of two people, a family is made up of more, of course. But um, um, so it was an opportunity for her to assert her doubt to, um, to manage them and she does it really beautifully. Um, and it was a chance for her and her father to reflect on the fact that their relationship had changed inevitably because she had got married and relationship changed. Um, and there's something beautiful about it changing, but there's also something hard. Um, so that was really what it ended up being. I've got no idea what it started as, but um, I, I, you know, uh, I, I was really happy with um how much um, beautiful work Katie uh, Stara put into um, into it. And she did an amazing job, I thought. There's an the absolutely beautiful moment when they're fishing together. That's just such a beautiful scene, so lovely and heartfelt. Um, can you tell us a bit about how the experience was for you of this, this writer's room? If Peter was saying that everyone together created the room that felt so inclusive and supportive and and wonderful and Annalisa made made it sound so amazing to to go to work there that it didn't even feel like work can you tell us about how that the dynamics of that and how that worked well um I mean it, it was just it was extraordinary I mean my my niece is a deaf person very much in terms of how I work because that Every time I do a video call, um, I need live captions. So, um, so when we were in the writer's room, there was also a, ca a live captioner in the room the whole time, um, typing up every single thing that was said um, and leaving uh, us with this beautiful transcript of every single joke that um, Pete said um, and every single idea and every single nuance and um, everything of food item and I can tell you there were a lot of food items discussed in this writer room um but yeah so my put my way of working very much with um captioners on video calls um and um the loveliest thing um so the question is always is there anything you need in order to do your job and and that was the question that was asked at the beginning of the writer's room before any of us had met each other um and then the question was asked again when we went on to step um, when uh, the show was in production. Um, and I explained that, you know, face masks are a nightmare for deaf people. And uh, there are so many kind of awkward moments when people realise that they're talking to you through the mask, even though you've explained that you're deaf and they remove the mask at that point. But I turned up for my um, visit on set um, and they had given everybody a clear mask. Um, so um, every single person on production that day um, wore a clear mask so that I could look read them. And so that's just, um, Annalisa gave a beautiful example of the level of thought um, that this show made, but it was, it was just a really touching thing that um, the burden wasn't on me to have to adapt to other people. They kind of all done it and they'd done it in a way that felt effortless and easy. Um, and um, so, yeah, so my experience was wonderful. Um, and I feel like I met an, an, you know, a beautiful bunch of people and writers, um, but that are also friends as well. 
And it, um, that sounds amazing. And how do you feel about the kind of legacy of the show now that's been done so beautifully and can be held up as a, a kind of beacon of good practice within the industry? What do you hope for from that? Well, it was really interesting coming from them, Barbara McAllen through Ralph and Katie because they were both very disabled, very much disabled led shows, but in very different ways. Um, you know, Ralph and Katie was a mainly a studio based show, um, and um, then Barbara McAllen was in London uh, on location um, and had a very, um, very, very large. Uh, um, set of extras in supporting cast uh, that all had different disabilities. So, you know, it, uh, there was, you know, a huge number of different disabilities in the cast and that set. On Ralph and Katie, um, there was a lot more um, processes and a lot more support mechanisms in terms of um, George Tufty and Jordan Hogg, um, producer and director, working together in terms of making it inclusive for cast and crew. Um, and um, I'm part of a um, group called the TV Access Project, um, which is um, a sort of pan-industry uh, collaboration between the broadcasters and the streamers about how we make sure that uh, all the debut cast and crew can access production from day one um, without having any difficulty with the geography of what the production is. So honey wagging, uh, post-production houses, uh, most of them are in historical buildings. So there's so many different complexities that uh, could, that could be made easier for the disabled person working in this industry. Um, so my hope from watching Ralph and Katie is that people develop an appetite for the production um, that they ask the question what what do we need to do in order to kind of recreate this sort of environment um, but also to take confidence from it and take inspiration from it in the sense that um, I think you know um, you know um, Sarah and Leon did just an insanely brilliant job beyond the expectations of what we could have hoped for. So um, the complexity of what they brought to their characters, and um, Pete said rightly, you know, it was very character-led, um, that people see disability as a far more nuanced thing um, than what they had previously. Yes, that's a, an incredible legacy, isn't it, for the for the show to have, to have... have reached the audience in that way and and to have communicated that is something really special thanks so much Genevieve we'll come back to you and, and again feel free to chip in um so I want to introduce you now to Lizzie Lizzie Watson um and Lizzie was on also on the BBC Writers Access Group and is currently developing some other work for TV and um this was your first TV credit wasn't it Lizzie yes terrifyingly yes that is true <laughs> Yeah. And also amazingly and brilliantly, how how good you um your pitch must have been and your your sample script to to get you through a, 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 all that competition and uh, no doubt people with with more experience too. So that was a a huge thing to achieve. Um, so I want to start with a really exciting question: What was it like to to get that call and to find out you were on the team? Oh, it was so weird. Like, it was great, but it was really weird. Um, I didn't expect it. And I know everyone always says that, but I genuinely didn't. I um, I applied for it because I kind of couldn't resist. I think we all felt that. There was just such a pull when I saw the advert to apply for it. And I just had so much fun developing the pitch and imagining all my kind of ridiculous Christmas shenanigans with Pete's kind of brilliant established characters. Uh, and I kind of had to send it off, but it was almost like it wasn't me. I, I kind of did it with no expectation and then didn't really think about it. And then as kind of the process developed and I got to meet with the team, it kind of felt a bit more real. Um, and then finally, when I did find out, I think it was after Christmas, sort of in January. Um, so I just had Christmas, which is weird because my episode was set at Christmas, um, getting that call. Um, it was amazing, but it was incredibly surreal. I think the whole process for me, this entire thing, even sitting here right now is incredibly surreal. I still don't think it's real, to be honest with you. People are constantly having to tell me that it is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I promise you we're all real. Yeah, and, yeah. and it's so amazing that you got to work with 
Peter Bowker on your your first job I mean all of you Lydia I think it's brilliant and um I imagine the only thing to top all of that was to see your episode how was that uh also surreal and great and Christmassy uh all of the things that I like uh love in, in life um yeah I still am repeating myself again but I still can't quite believe it's happened um it is a Christmas episode too and it came out in October so I can only apologize to everyone for bringing Christmas forward by two months um but yeah um I, I have watched it I do occasionally still go on iPlayer and I see it kind of pop up and I have a little palpitation because I can't believe it's there uh yeah it's been an incredible experience really incredible I've made a mental note Lizzie to watch it again when I've got my Christmas tree up and, oh. and you know all of those things so, so it's good and uh, maybe people will will watch it again I'm sure they will um can you tell us a bit about some of the practicalities of of writing so it was your first time doing it um what was the process like in terms of once your pitch had been signed off um how long did you have to write a draft and how many drafts did you do and what happened with the script editor oh um I think what was great about this process was obviously we had a time frame but we had a lot of um support and lots of check-ins about how much time we needed what was going on with the process um I think Jen touched on it a little bit or maybe it was Annalise who touched on it sorry that we did have some cast change arounds um during the process as well which for me that happened between my first and my second draft we had a bit of a cast change so I had basically up to that point I was writing what I had pitched which I think is really uh, not that common I think normally when you pitch something to get on a show well from my knowledge of it you don't tend to write exactly what you've pitched and I kind of was I felt quite lucky because I managed to basically maintain what I pitched for my episode and then the uh, cast change happened and I had to kind of we all had to sort of wheel around and figure out um, what changes to make and I'm just so grateful to have had such a supportive uh, kind of creative team behind me because I did panic because I didn't really know it's my first experience writing um, I've been in script in uh, writers rooms as a script editor before that but I've never kind of I'd never written professionally in that way uh, so we did have to do some wrangling but um, outside of that kind of panic I always felt like we had quite a lot of time uh, to deliver our drafts I think I needed a little bit more handholding I definitely would have needed a bit more handholding than the other writers because I was so new I still am very new uh, but yeah I never felt rushed I never felt like I was under a massive pressure yeah, and I, I kind of feel like because this was my first proper writer's room, my, you know, the benchmark is incredibly high for me now. I expect all writer's rooms to be like this. Uh, so, yeah, long may that continue. <laughs> Absolutely, long may it continue. That's a, uh, that should be our theme, I think, shouldn't it? Maybe that should be our anthem at the end. Long may it continue, <laughs> for sure. Um, so, uh, Lizzie, can you tell us a bit as well about your experience of the room um, when it came to devising the other characters, because we've talked a lot about Ralph and Katie, but we've not mentioned too much the other characters that didn't appear in the, the A word. Yes, of course. So we um, we knew we had to find some interesting characters to sort of support our leads and kind of, you know, work with them and have an, an interesting dynamic. So we kind of knew we wanted to have two uh, support, well, fairly central characters, really. So we came up with Emma and we came up with Danny. Uh, and Danny, I think, came first from memory. We sort of started working with him and he was going to be in the sort of support worker role, but obviously doing it in his own fabulous way, uh, as Dylan Brady brings to life. Uh, and I think a lot of it was sort of our own shared experience of, of how some of us had experience of working with support workers, um, also family members. I think Annalisa can talk a bit about the inspiration that went into Danny from her own family. Um, I'll let her do that. But um, yeah, it was... It was great because we had a lot of leeway. There was a lot of room for us to discuss it and distill it down. Um, we didn't come into it with any kind of preconceived uh, ideas, really. I think Pete had a sort of idea that one would be a support worker um, who would maybe support both of the characters, the central characters, and we'd also have another character who would work with Katie. But beyond that, we were all able to sort of pitch in. Um, and that was great. Um, I love watching the episodes now and seeing little details. I remember us talking about way at the beginning. Um, that's one of the biggest joys for me. I just sit there like a nerd, like, oh, I remember when we said that in the third session. Um, yeah, it, there's little bits of all of us in all the episodes. That's what I love. Um, even in mine, there's bits of everybody else. And I love, I love that. Amazing. Thank you, Lizzie. And also, Lizzie, where are you in the country? I forgot to ask everyone. <laughs> I'm in Leeds. I'm in really, and that's why, I mean, it's really dark everywhere I know, but I'm in a specifically very dark part of the country for some reason at the moment. It's very dark here, but Leeds. 
in lead. Thank you. And let's let's whiz back to Annalisa. You know, I also I forgot to ask you, where are you, Annalisa? I'm in South London. And can you tell us about the inspiration for the character there? That <laughs> this is always referred to. Um, my brother was a support worker and his name is Danny. Um, so we started, Danny does magic tricks. Um, but the um, the character evolved and his sexuality changed. <laughs> <So> <laughs> <laughs> but what was interesting was actually I think Tom Wentworth who we really haven't spoken about enough uh, who was an absolutely invaluable part of the room and purveyor of, of, of cake um, I think he had a very similar vision for the support worker as well I think in, there were moments where we all sort of had the same idea at the same time actually and we should mention um, so Tom is also very involved with the Writers Guild and has has been on um, the Disabled Writers Working Party. Um, and we also um, should mention Amy Trigg, shouldn't we, who isn't with us today, who's also a member of the team. Um, can I just whisk back to Peter just before we start to open up to questions? So do um, put your questions in the chat. I'm sure there are lots of questions in there already. I'm sure there's so much that you want to, to cover. Um, Peter, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about what you've learned from the process of doing this for the, the first time with, with these writers and um, what your highlights have been. And also if there's anything that you would change um, should there be hopefully a series two because we all really want a series two. Um, well, um, I learned not to share my jokes with Tom Wentworth because <laughs> he makes them slightly better. Um, I think what I learned was it was possible to look, we're all writers and we don't we're not we don't do the American thing of being used to being on a team writers you know you know the, the English the British television tradition is individual writers with an individual voice uh, I think a lot of I'm amongst writers now so I think we all know that one of the reasons possibly emotional reasons we become writers is we want to create we want to put the world in our heads out there and in our individual voice. So the first thing I learned, one of the take, great takeaways from this is actually, if you do, if you collaborate in a spirit of openness, it's there's kind of more of you out there, not less of you. You're not diluting your individual vision, you're, you're enriching. Uh, and that's an important lesson for me. Unfortunately, I'm 63, so I wish I probably learned it about 20 years ago, but there we are. The other, the, and in just, I just want to mention something else about the process, that what we were very cognizant of was that Leon and Sarah's voices were represented in that room. We would talk to Leon and Sarah about the plot ideas, what their response would be as two adults, with Down syndrome, with lived experience, and we would tap into that. It was it was creatively a gift to us, um, and um, so they were part. They were part of the creative process as well. Um, but the so that in a way I learned that, and I also learned that it's quite a uh it was the fun is in sparking off each other and in terms of developing something um that somebody would suggest a character you know as as um as lizzie was saying you know somebody would suggest a character and we we have the room to kind of go down dead ends and then find something in the dead end that we might then bring back create the character so it felt it felt very sort of productive in, in that regard the things I think the things there are things I would like to change 
going forward in terms of how we it, as a writer I believe the writer should be on set all the time so even um, and that is always a battle that you're going to have the less experience you have um, I would probably push harder for one of the writing team to be on set every day especially around their material um, I think there were it was, you know, don't get me wrong, the shoot was amazingly um, enabled and it was um, amazingly friendly. I just think I uh, might would have pushed even harder. I think I'd have been pushing an open door, but I think as in any production process, the writers are not necessarily seen as a necessary part of the production process. I happen to think they are. I think that whether the writer is disabled or not, and I think I would I would push harder for that next time. Um, it, uh, the, so what I would like to see going forward would be, I think it's my job going forward, would be for me to take a step back, which would be painful for me because I've enjoyed it so much, and for the writer's room to be led by a disabled writer. The other thing I think, I imagine all of us agree on this, is to again return to Leon and Sarah and talk, as, I, as we talk throughout the A word in fairness, to parents and, and to young people with Down syndrome and, um, you know, to carry on making that you know, it was, I think Genevieve, it struck a nerve when Genevieve was talking about when she started out, casting your net wider, casting your net widely. Um, but the other thing, the trap I wouldn't want to fall into is to make, and this was a criticism of the A word, and, it was, and it's a legitimate criticism because it's exactly what I'm trying to do, is I write, my, my writing is very mainstream. My writing, my representation is rather gentle. And that's what I do, and that's how my career has been. I wrote something, you know, I've written things like Occupation, which are very hard hitting, but on the whole, it hasn't been that way. And then, you know, so it's my belief that then you, what you do is smuggle the grit into that. You know, these are still genuine dilemmas. These are still uh, authentic emotional, political, social experiences that we're doing. It's just the style of the show may fool you into thinking this is a rather gentle piece. Uh, so, you know, that, that, though, that's the kind of creative choice. I'm, and I, I'm always wary that you could lose that because it's easier to go hard in on. What, whereas what all three of the writers here did rather wonderfully was find a genuine strain in a family relationship that could have gone could have gone quite dark could have, and find a way of telling that in the style of the show and I think that's you know testimony to their talent and adaptability in terms of how and also in terms of creation of character by the way I was only called upon to create the character of Brian the well-meaning but clumsy aging liberal neighbor I have no idea why that I would be seen as any kind of role model for that. But there we are. Um, Thank you so okay. much. Sorry, you were going to say something else. No, no, I'd say I think that is I would see that as my job in the in the wider sense of, of, of trying to be a, an ally to this process. Um, it, it, but I think it would also work because there is so much talent out there and it would open up more opportunity. Um, and that it would be incredible. And we, that's a really good um, link into our questions from our uh, attendees, because I suspect there are lots of writers out there interested in whether or not there might be opportunities in the future. So we're going to have a look for questions. Kate, I might ask you to just give me a hand with some of the 
questions as it's quite a busy chat box there. If I uh, start. Yes, with... I've, I've just sent you um, the first three, which is in the chat box a little way up from the bottom, but I'm very happy to read those out if that makes it easier. Yes, we, please and, do. Uh, Please shout if, if um, obviously we, we've gone through uh, these before. So first one from Jana. Uh, what things did the team learn to make the writers room more inclusive and accessible? I don't know if you have anything to add. Um, sure. I think we've, we might have. You feel you've covered, have covered, covered that. that yes. Yes. Unless anyone yes. has anything extra. Anything else to add to that? In? No, I think, think we've no, no. covered that since Liana asked. Uh, 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 what was it that made each script and pitch stand out when it came to the initial selection? And what were you looking with them? Again, you've covered a bit of this, but was there anything else that really you were on the okay, um, on that shall I answer? Shall I answer that? Yes, please. Yeah. Um, I think um, because, the sh because the A word already existed, it was, um, so there was a suggestion of what the tone of the show might be. So the things we were looking for in the pitch wasn't a kind of watertight story, but a sense that the person writing it had an idea about the tone of the show. And I think that is true of most people who are looking at pitches for most shows, that if, you can demonstrate that you kind of get the world, um, then the actual plotting doesn't have to be kind of watertight and perfect. Um, and the other thing was, the, because this is a very specific half hour show, that the story could be contained within the production that we had. Um, and that there was an understanding of L Leon and Sarah's strengths as actors and also some things that may make them vulnerable um, or so to tell stories that would always have them at the centre but wouldn't necessarily demand that Sarah and Leon were in every scene having to learn incredibly long pieces of dialogue which um, both actors would identify was areas where they felt vulnerable. So those, I think those were the, I mean, in the end with a show like this, you're looking for a story where there might, I would always advise anybody pitching a story to uh, find a way in the pitch to even have a couple of lines of dialogue because of this kind of dialogue that they might have in that story because that's how we tell our stories. So that's how, you, and in the most, for the most part, I think everybody who pitched had a little exchange or something. And that's what, I think that's what I was looking for. That's what we were all looking for. That's a um, great answer. Thank you. That really brings it to life, doesn't it? When you've got that bit of dialogue. Yeah. Um, and Carol's asking, will there be another series? I don't know if there's any news on that front currently. Um, um, there's, there's no there's no news on that only because the BBC well all companies take a while to make those decisions um, and I think we will need to hear soon because the setting up requires some organisation as well but no I don't know yet we, we, I think we'd all be happy to go again if it was um, but I don't know yet. So we'll all of us collectively cross our fingers yes. And, yes, because we love it and we really want it back. Um, I'm going to do another question and then maybe Kate, you could find the one after for me would be. Yes, easy. of course. Yep. Please. So um, Declan says, um, were there any times during your pitches, this is addressed to the the um, the other writers, where it was hard to get your pitches to come across to the heads of the producers. So I think this might be also in your written pitches, but also within the room when you're pitching ideas. I want to ask this especially since I worry about struggling with, with pitching and I guess about being heard. Um, so let's ask Genevieve, first of all. Oh, 
Um, well, um, I, I suppose the very, very uh, easy way for me to answer it is that um, I guess falling back onto the idea of being an actor and being a performer is that um, I, I'm a pretty good bullshitter when I'm nervous. So um, I don't know, I guess that I, I, I smother a lot of the stuff that I'm nervous about by rambling on um, as I'm demonstrating very well now. Um, but um, um, I, I do think that being truthful about who you are um, and, and what you would the right to bring to a process is very important and, um, and being genuine with people. Um, I think that um, the more that you are organised in terms of um, I don't know, bullet pointing, bullet pointing all your notes on a piece of paper and having them in front of you to pull back on is quite reassuring. Um, but um, I, I actually found the writing part, the harder part, so I guess I'm quite lucky in this, that um, from my side of things, the pitching thing seems to be a little bit more comfortable for me than the actual reality of sitting down and putting pen to paper. That's lovely. Thank you, Genevieve. Let's ask the same question to Lizzie. Um, so Lizzie, shall I repeat it for you? So um, Declan's asking, were there any times doing your pitching? So um, not just the written pitch, but perhaps more so when you're in the room. And it, as this is, was your first experience, it's a good question for you, especially. Um, was it hard to get your ideas to, to come across and go into the heads of, of the producers? Um, and Declan's someone who feels that they struggle with pitching. Yes, um, that's the short answer. Yes, um, not that um, it was difficult to for the producers or the, you know to understand what I was saying. I I think I struggled with speaking up. It's something I struggle with in my general life. Um, communicating what I'm trying to say. Uh, I get very nervous. Um, I think a lot of people do, but I did find, especially this was my first experience, I was really nervous going into the room. Uh, do you suffer from a bit of the old imposter syndrome? I think a lot of people do, but you know, it was a big opportunity for me. So I had a lot of time where I was stressing, worrying about what to say. Zoom, as you know, I was often muted and not realizing I was muted. So that added an extra layer to that. Um, but what I would say is with this process, the whole point of it was they were making it as possible and accessible for me to communicate in the way that it suited me best. So continuously the question was, are we doing this in the way that works for you? If I had thoughts or questions afterwards, I didn't get to say in the session, I could email them, I could communicate in a way that, that worked for me. Um, I think the great thing about this process was there were no kind of silly questions. There was no sense that you were being judged on what you said. And I think my advice would be when you're joining a project and you're pitching to those producers and those collaborators, I think hopefully those people will be the right kind of people who want to adapt to your way of communicating uh, because that was the situation with this process. It wasn't always easy uh, because I generally find this kind of thing really hard, um, but it is possible when people do want to listen and those ideas are important. So yeah, I think it's always worth asking or explaining that you're finding it hard. Thank you, Lizzie. That's a brilliant answer. And Sorry, uh, could yes. I just, yeah, I just wanted to add something to what uh, Libby and Genevieve said that, um, and not, you know, none of us, I think, uh, are particularly brilliant at pitching. I think it's, you have to reimagine the pitching as a conversation you're having. Imagine it as a conversation rather than a sales pitch. And I think that frees you up to be able to explore it. And I think that's, uh, having been on the receiving end of pitching and pitched myself, including once pitching to an American executive who fell asleep during my pitch, so I know the pain. Um, and there was a mirror behind him, so I could see myself dying on my ass <laughs> as this was going. The, it's the, it's imagine, re, shift it in your head to a conversation a description of a show you've seen last night and why you enjoyed it. What key pertinent plot points may or may not be, but think of it as a conversation rather than a pitch. We just don't, we're not temperamentally suited to be American pitchers. God knows, I, as I sent somebody to asleep, I know this to be true. Um, and that way, 
you will also find the good people to pitch to because they will want to engage in a conversation too. Thank you. That's that's um, gold dust, isn't it, for people? That's really helpful. And something that we haven't talked about yet, but I want to mention because we might have some producers listening as well as writers, is that Dank have recently launched their guidelines for disability inclusion in the UK TV production industry, um, which have got all sorts of brilliant um, guidelines in there around five A's that people should be embracing in the industry and bringing into their work with um, disabled people in all areas of the industry, but especially important for us as writers, which are around um, anticipating, asking, assessing, adjusting and advocating. And we won't go any further now than to have mentioned them, but they are on the Dank website. So, so writers and producers and everyone else, please do take a look at those. Um, Kate, have you got another question for us, please? I, I have indeed. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, yes, I've got one from Fiona. Um, I really rated the testicular lump episode, she says, and following on from that, I'd like to see their sexual relationship made more explicit, as I felt it was possibly a bit curtailed into childishness due to perceptions about the audience or perhaps the place in the schedule. Was it? Who, who wants to feel that one, Peter, maybe? Um, well, I think it's interesting where the show... I, it was always an ambition that the show would be post-Watershed. Um, and there was some debate once we'd made it about whether they were going to put it pre-Watershed. But because the language that Leon and Sarah use in certain episodes, we absolutely wanted to retain in order to portray them as um, adults and not to infantilize them. I think if I, I don't think there are two separate things here. I don't think this show I don't think the tone of the show, I think it would accommodate a more acknowledgement of their sex life, but I don't think we would be, I, I don't think it's a show that would have um, explicit sexual or non-explicit or sexual content much beyond what it has already, because I don't think that's the tone of the show. So I think that's different to the question that's being asked. And I don't, I would possibly push back on it being infantile. We, 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 we saw them in bed together. We saw, I mean, Jordan, the director was very keen that, um, you know, Kate, uh, Katie would be wearing nightwear that was not always like, it was sometimes, uh, not kind of always cosy pajamas and so on. I think it's it would be a slightly different show, um, and I'm talking in terms in terms of the show rather than the issue of infantilizing adults with Down syndrome. Um, I think there is room for a show. There is desperate need for a show where. Um, we start to take it for granted that people uh, have explored, you know, have a sexuality and a sexual presence. I think in this show, it is clear that they have a sex life and that is possibly as far as this show would accommodate that. Thank you. Um, we, we are over time, so I'm just gonna squeeze in two quick final questions, if that's okay. Um, Grace asks, and this sums up questions from other people as well. Is there a way to um, contact people or stay in touch about future opportunities? How would people find out about those? Um, sorry, come on. No, that was it. I think it would be the usual. I mean, whenever there are, uh, from my point of view, the, the places I would, would push, um, the publicity around opportunities would be yourself, the Writers Guild, BBC Writers Room and Dank. Those are the three places I go 
to, you know, to yeah. and that's where people should carry on looking, I think. Great, thank I don't you. know, Genevieve, do you have any, are there any other organisations? And... I don't think so. I think those are the obvious places to go. There is also uh, DDPTV, which is Deaf and Disabled People in Television, and that is a Facebook group for all uh, disabled industry creatives. So um, if you have lived experience of disability, you can join that Facebook group and there's, you know, well over a thousand people on there and um, different opportunities um, for crew within production uh, posted on there and DDPTV make sure that um, that those processes and those interview processes and those jobs will be accessible to disabled people. So um, that's a really good resource if you're interested in that on facebook.com. Thank you. Yes, that's a, a great one. And um, our very last question is from Rachel, a question for Peter. She says, Indies sometimes claim that supporting uh, or hiring actors and writers with disabilities costs more any tips on how we can make the case for doing it um well i think well there are two one is in terms of the writing end of um, things this is demonstrably not true um two i i it depends where <laughs> it depends where you think it's important to spend your money as a producer and I would have thought giving access to more talent is, is surely going to pay for itself um I don't it is you know it, it there are adjustments that will cost money um but I think there are there are also places where I can see money is spent that could be used more wisely in terms of giving access. But the whole thing about costing money seems to me something a red herring, because what you're doing is actually making better shows as a result of that. So, I, you know, that's what I would push back on. But in the end, if somebody's going to say that costs too much, it's quite hard to push back on that, because that seems to me a bit of a brick wall. And there are plenty of adjustments that don't cost anything at all. Um, and so, I was sorry, just going to say that um, you know there are a lot of conversations about bringing in a line in the budget um, for assets at the moment across the industry. So bringing something in that is from the green light um, in terms of providing um, broader access news. So I do think there is change happening in the industry in terms of recognizing that uh, that. Um, assets can't be thought about as a kind of last minute um, option. It has to be something that is made a priority from the beginning if you want to um, cast and crew up inclusively on production. So um, I think it's a really optimistic place to be in, um, in terms of what the changes are going to be. Um, but I'd say that a few years into the industry. So um, I'd say that without any cynicism whatsoever. I would also just question the, the assumption and I would I would invite people who might be concerned that it costs more money to actually speak to the talent involved because a lot of disabled freelancers don't cost anymore because we have our own access to work grants um, and we pay for everything we cover our own costs which are then paid for by access to work so I think I would just invite people to say it is that true yes. um, or is that just an assumption that was a really important extra thing to add on there. Thank you so much to, to all of you. Um, so I just want to round off by saying a huge thank you to everyone. It's been so, so brilliant to have the opportunity to celebrate Ralph and Katie that we all love so much and also hear how you achieved the, the wonderful um, series that you did. Um, I also want to say to, to all of the writers out there, a lot of you will be members, but you may, we may have some people there who aren't. You may not know that 
uh, the Writers Guild is is more than a, a trade union. It's a community of, of well networked writers, and within that we have a, a strong community of disabled writers, um, and that's why we're we're having events like these. Um, we have the Equality and Diversity Committee. We have a disabled writers working party. Um, we would love for more members to join us and for existing members to, to get involved. So do have a look at the, the website for details of all of those things and for other events too. Um, and we're going to have a quick whiz round to talk about next projects. We know Amy Trigg, who couldn't be with us today because she's busy performing her play, Reasons You Should Slash Shouldn't Love Me, at um, the Kiln Theatre, and she's there until the 26th of November. So if you're looking for a good night out, um, the Kiln. And let's just whiz around everyone else. What are you up to, Annalisa? I'm busy working on a show that hasn't been announced, so I can't talk about <laughs> it. But um, I can say, I suppose I can say that it's very, very different from sex education. Okay. Wildly Thank different. You. That's all I can say. And you sound excited. <laughs> yes, I'm very excited. I can't wait for it to be announced. Brilliant. Thank you. And Genevieve, what are you up to? Um, I am working on a show for uh, Channel 4. Um, so an eight-parter um, about being part of the deaf community and what deaf identity is um, in a kind of rear window sort of thriller um, context. So that's going to be my um, main focus next year. So I'm really excited about that. Oh, that sounds that sounds wonderful. Really, that sounds so good. And Lizzie, what are you up to? Um, it's kind of the same as Annalisa. The ink is not yet dry, so I can't really talk about it, I'm afraid. But um, I am excited. Um, I'm gonna be doing some of my own original sort of stuff for the first time, which I'm quite excited about, uh, but can't really say anything more. But I will, hey, yeah, really I will let you know. Really yeah. excited, that's good. And Peter, what are you working on at the moment? Anything you can tell us? Yeah, uh, excited. I'm in. Um, we're. I'm in post production on um, World on Fire, second series of World on Fire, um, uh, which will take longer to tell than the war actually took to fight, because lockdown stopped the second series by three years. Um, and again, I have something that Patrick has told. I was going to mention it, but Patrick told me I can't. Uh, Patrick Spencer also. Um, whose company made um, Ralph and Katie, but I, yeah, I'm working on um, something that I, again, can't talk about. Um, and I'm, I'm cooking up a, I'm cooking up a kind of combination police thriller thing that may well feature Leon Harrop, so. Oh, mm. oh, well, that's a tease, mm. isn't it? Exactly. brilliant thank you so um again thank you so much to everyone for your time and your talent and your brilliant series and your brilliant energy this afternoon